Ah. Hello, dear friends, and welcome to part four of this softly spoken read-through of British Kings and Queens. A lovely little history of the monarchy, ever since the monarchy began. Little biographies on every single king and queen who have ruled this country. We start part four with Henry the Fourth, Bonningbrook, the House of Lancaster. You may start to recognise some of these names as appearing in Shakespeare plays, Richard the Second, Richard the Third, etc. So Henry Bolingbroke didn't have the best claim to the throne of England. Richard the Second was his first cousin, but once in power, Henry's greatest problems concerned the Scottish border raids and renewed one hundred years war conflicts with France. Born in Bolingbroke Castle in Lincolnshire in 1367, he was the son of John of Gaunt and Blanche of Lancaster. And the pair were cousins and needed papal dispensation to marry. In July 1380, Henry married Mary de Bohun, and together they had seven children. She died in childbirth in 1394, and Henry married again in 1403 to Joanna of Navarre, daughter of Charles de Evreux, the King of Navarre, and they had no children. In 1386, Henry Bolingbroke joined forces with an influential opposition of nobles hostile to the rule of Richard II, and as we learned in the previous part, he overcame Richard II, who surrendered without a fight and abdicated the throne. Here is his tomb in Canterbury Cathedral, and a gold noble of Henry IV. So while abroad, Henry allied with the exiled Thomas Arundel, former Archbishop of Canterbury, and together they returned to England at the head of an army in 1399, quickly acquired popular support from both nobility and peasantry, alienated by Richard II. Here is an image of um, Henry, Duke of Lancaster, as proclaimed in King Henry IV by Parliament. Very bird-like imagery. And here's the Battle of Agincourt, very famous battle of Henry V, which we'll get onto in a moment, another Shakespearean subject. Henry Bolingbroke was crowned Henry IV in October 1399, but while establishing his superior claim to the throne, he had to put down a series of small rebellions, and an outbreak of the Black Death in 1400 was accompanied by a rebellion in Wales. Three years later, he then allied with the Henry Percy, Earl of Northumberland, and his son Henry, or Harry Hotspur. The latter, however, was killed at the Battle of Shrewsbury in July 1403, and further rebels were executed in York, bringing the revolt to an end. To finance his Scottish and French adventures, Henry had to petition Parliament for grants of money. They weren't sympathetic and instead accused him of being reckless with money, but bargained new powers over royal appointments and finances in exchange for the funds Henry needed. From 1405 onwards, Henry suffered from a debilitating skin disease, possibly leprosy, and another acute unknown illness. This left a vacancy at the head of government, where his eldest son Henry was only too happy to fill. Henry died in 1413, and it had been prophesied that he would die in Jerusalem. He did. The room he was taken to was the Jerusalem chamber in the house of the Abbot of Westminster. He was buried in Canterbury Cathedral, near the shrine of Thomas Beckett. So we now move on to the, Henry, uh, the famous Henry V once more into the breach, dear friends, ruling the 14, 1413 to 1422. So one of the great English kings, King Henry V, consolidated England through his monarchy and his military abilities, um, and would have unified the crowns of England and France had he lived a little over two months longer. He promoted the use of England as the language of government instead of Norman French, and was the first king for over 300 years to correspond in English. Born in Monmouth Castle to Henry Bolingbroke, as we've just learned, his wife, 16-year-old Mary de Bowen, he was not at the time in line for the throne. Here is a uh, painting of Henry V. When his father was exiled in 1398, Richard II became the boy's unofficial protector. When his father became king, Henry became heir to the throne and was created Prince of Wales at his father's coronation, and was soon leading his father's armies into Wales to fight Olain Glyndwyr, and then to defeat Henry Hotspur at the Battle of Shrewsbury. Henry V immediately succeeded Henry IV, and was crowned on April the 9th, 1413. He first publicly declared policy was to forget old enmities and unite the kingdom. 
many nobles who had their lands and titles confiscated gradually had them returned and peace returned to the land, although Henry had to crush a rebellion in the name of Edmund Mortimer in 1415. Then Henry returned to France to fulfil his ambitions and recapture lost English lands. In August 1415 he set sail for Harfleur in Normandy, which he captured. Then the army marched towards Calais, but turned to fight the pursuing French army at Agincourt. There his exhausted but skilled longbowmen fought to a decisive victory on October the 25th, 1415. Here is a 15th century French manuscript showing the Battle of Agincourt. In the intervening period and throughout, the French and the Church were constantly falling out with each other and swapping alliances. This disunited situation allowed Henry real advantage. In 1417, with the assistance of his brothers and the Duke of Clarence, Bedford and Gloucester, he resumed his advance across France as they conquered Lower Normandy and besieged Rouen. The city fell in January 1419 and retribution was taken against the Norman French. Henry then marched on Paris and was at the gates by August. The king and the French aristocracy still could not agree and many nobles allied themselves to Henry V as he captured Picardy and much of the Ile de France. Six months of negotiation resulted in the Treaty of Troyes in 1420 and the potential alliance of the crowns of England and France through marriage. In June 1420, he married Catherine of Valois, the daughter of King Charles VI of France, and together they had one son, the future King Henry VI. The marriage was part of the provisions of the Treaty of Troyes, along with the repossession of the old Plantagenet territories of Normandy and Aquitaine. Another clause made Henry regent of France for King Charles's lifetime, and then king after him, so England and France would be united under one crown. This never happened because Henry died first, just two months before Charles. That's an interesting sliding door moment in history, isn't it? By the end of 1420, Henry returned to England, and the following year went on to royal progress with Catherine around the kingdom but in seven months he was back in France again, campaigning in the north. However, after victories at Dreux, Chartres and Mont, Henry suddenly died at 34, just outside Paris. The cause was probably dysentery, caught during the siege of Mont, and he named his brother, John of Lancaster, Duke of Bedford, as regent of France for his infant son, Henry VI. He was born while Henry was campaigning, and he'd never seen him. His body was taken back to London and buried in Westminster Abbey. So we then have Henry the Sixth, who ruled from the fourteen twenty two to the fourteen seventy one. I don't know why I'm saying that, but that's when he ruled. As the English crown lost its French lands, England was riven with the War of the Roses, a nasty civil war over which side had the more legitimate claim to the throne. Henry the Sixth presided over one of the bloodiest reigns in English history, although he wasn't a military leader. Within eight months after his father left Henry V to campaign in France, he was dead, and Henry became King of England. And then two months later, his grandfather Charles VI of France died, King of France, so he was crowned King of England. And in 1429 in Westminster Abbey, and King of France in 1431 in Notre Dame in Paris. His young French mother was not trusted, so his uncle Humphrey. Duke of Gloucester was appointed protector and head of the English Regency Council, and his other uncle, John, Duke of Bedford, regent for France. However, when the latter died in 1435, Burgundy broke their alliance with England, and English rule dissolved in France. This was the period of Joan of Arc and the Dauphin, and the French triumphs in the Hundred Years' War as England lost ground, including Normandy, in 1450. Here is an image of Henry VI crowned at Westminster Abbey and Notre Dame. 1431, uh, and a portrait of Henry VI here. In 1437, Henry came of age and took his place at the head of government, but he lacked political judgment and allowed factionalism, as his favourites exercised too much influence. The war party, who wanted to regain lost French territories, were ignored, and Henry sought peace through a dynastic marriage to a 16-year-old Margaret of Anjou, the Queen of France's niece, in 1445. His widowed mother, Catherine, had a long-standing relationship with Owen Tudor, resulting in at least six children and the eventual Tudor claim to the throne. 
Henry's government was increasingly corrupt, extravagant and unpopular, especially with the loss of even more French territories. Then in 1453, Henry had a complete mental breakdown on hearing of a bad English defeat in Aquitaine and Richard, Duke of York, was made protector of the realm. The following year, even Henry's recovery in 1455 was not enough to stop the growing crisis between the Yorkists and Lancastrians, which bloomed into a civil war known as the War of the Roses. The Red Rose, of course, symbolising Lancashire, and the White Rose symbolising York. The Yorkist cause was led by the Duke of York, who made his claim through Edward III's second surviving son via his mother. Henry VI's claim was through the third surviving son and his father. The matter was but partially settled when the Duke of York was killed at the Battle of Wakefield in 1460, leaving his son Edward to take his place. The Lancastrians were beaten at the Battle of Towton, and London opened the city gates to the victors. Henry and Margaret fled to Scotland, as Edward of York was crowned Edward IV. In 1465, Henry returned to reclaim his throne, but was instead captured and imprisoned in the Tower of London. But the Earl of Warwick changed sides and restored Henry as king in 1470 and exiled Edward. That was short-lived, though. Following the Battle of Tewkesbury, where his son Edward, Prince of Wales, was killed, Henry was again captured and returned to the Tower, where he was murdered on May 21, 1471, eventually buried at Windsor Castle. So we see a change of house with the House of York, 1461 to 1483, with Edward IV, who was the second son of Richard Plantagenet, Duke of York, and Cecily Neville, a granddaughter of Edward III. So, during the War of the Roses, his father was the leading Yorkist until he was killed at the Battle of Wakefield in 1460, where Edward inherited his position. The Earl of Warwick was determined to control the 19-year-old king, um, and was working on a dynastic marriage for him when Edward secretly married his commoner sweetheart, Elizabeth Woodfill, and then promoted most of her relatives. The furious Earl then switched sides to support George, Duke of Clarence, Edward's younger brother, and led a revolt against the king. When they were unsuccessful, they fled to France to join Margaret of Anjou, Henry VI's vastly more capable wife, and together with French support they invaded England in September 1470 and briefly restored Henry to the throne of England. Together with French support they invaded England in September 1470 and briefly restored Henry to the throne of England. But Edward and his brother, the Duke of Gloucester, regrouped in Burgundy and returned in March 1471, defeated Warwick, killed him at the battle, then defeated the Lancastrians, and Henry was imprisoned and murdered. The restored monarchy of Edward VI saw a reign when England was at peace and recovering from the bloody civil war. Trade was revived through new commercial treaties and government settled down. Edward largely used the income from his crown estate's profits to pay the expenses of his government rather than request levies and subsidies from Parliament, and he tightly controlled the royal revenues and would often sit in person during court cases. In 1475, Edward declared war on France and almost immediately concluded a peace with Louis XI. The Treaty of Piquigny saw Margaret of Anjou ransomed, and pensions agreed with Edward and many of his nobles, but not his brother, who became Richard III. With his wealth in decline, Edward had time to consider his will. He named his twelve-year-old son Edward his heir, with his uncle Richard as protector, and died on April 9th, 1483, aged 41, and was buried at Windsor Castle. His two young sons, Edward V and Richard, were left in the care of their uncle Richard, Duke of Gloucester, and he placed them under protection in the Tower of London, where they were almost certainly murdered. The Prince is in the Tower legend, of course, probably by Richard, to stop them from reappearing as pretenders for the crown. With Elizabeth Woodville, Edward had fathered ten legitimate children, seven daughters and three sons, and also had a number of illegitimate children. Parliament petitioned Richard to take the throne. He accepted and was crowned Richard III. Here is Edward IV at Calais after the Battle of Lutford and a portrait of Edward IV. We now have Edward V slash Richard the Third, 1483 to 1485, because Richard the Third is quite possibly the most controversial English monarch. The um, famous Shakespeare play, of course. This is the famous painting of Edward V and Richard, Duke of York, in the Tower of London. The two princes in the Tower who disappeared. And another painting of Edward V. His reputation was shattered by the suspicion that he murdered his young nephews in the Tower of London. 
The Tudors liked to stigmatise him as Richard Crookback, and claimed he had a withered arm, one short leg and a hump, all of which are almost certainly lies created to blacken his character and justify their claim to the throne. But what is so interesting, of course, is that this book would have been published well before the discovery of Richard III in the car park in Leicester, a famous discovery, as he was um, found by archaeologists and dug up, and of course he did actually have misalignments of his spine. During his short reign, the first laws written entirely in English were promulgated. Born at Fotheringay Castle in Northamptonshire in October 1452, he had a claim to the throne through both parents, Cecily Neville and Richard Plantagenet. He was their fourth and youngest surviving son, and born just before the official outbreak of the War of the Roses in 1455, so his early life was dominated by the conflict. Here's a famous painting of Richard III, who was greatly maligned by his enemies and later historians. In July 1472, Richard married Anne Neville, the youngest daughter of the Earl of Warwick, and a friend since childhood. He had one son, son who died aged nine, and he also fathered a few illegitimate children. On Edward VI's death in 1483, Richard was made Lord Protector of his young nephews, 12-year-old Edward V and 9-year-old Richard, Duke of York, whom he lodged in the Tower of London for protection, the princes in the Tower, as I mentioned before. Wanting the throne for himself, he proclaimed that Edward IV's uh, marriage to Elizabeth Woodville was invalid because he had married before. This meant the children were illegitimate, so Edward V was a usurper. On June the 25th, the Lords and Commoners agreed the argument and asked Richard, as true heir, to be their king. He was crowned in July at Westminster Abbey. The princes in the tower were never heard from again, and probably died in August. Richard was accused of murdering them. Richard did what he could to reconcile with the Lancastrians, but in October disquieted the country. Uh, abrupted, this all erupted in rebellion, started by the Duke of Buckingham. Although it quickly collapsed, it was clear that a good proportion of the gentry and aristocracy ceased to support Richard. So the Lancastrian claimant to the throne, Henry Tudor, Earl of Richmond, came out of exile to land an army in South Wales. Richard and his army rushed to meet them, and a two-hour-long battle at Bosworth Field ensued on August the 22nd. The king had the bigger army, but a number of his important supporters, such as the Earl of Northumberland and the Earl of Derby, deserted him. Even though his situation was dire, he refused to flee and was killed on the field of battle, leaving Henry Tudor victorious. He was buried, aged 32, in an unmarked grave in Leicester, and was the last of the Plantagenet dynasty and the final king of the House of York. Without a legitimate son, Richard named his nephew John de la Pole, Earl of Lincoln, his older sister's son, as his heir. But as we know, the Tudors then came in to play a very famous royal dynasty. Here is a statue of Henry VII from Bath Abbey. Henry the Seventh, House of Tudor, 1485 to 1509. Henry Tudor was born in Pembroke, the eldest, only son of Edmund Tudor, and the eldest son of Catherine of Wallar, the widow of Henry V, and her second husband, Owen Tudor, and Lady Margaret Beaufort, her great great granddaughter of John of Gaunt, son of Edward III, with whom Henry had made his claim for the throne. In 1483, on Edward IV's death, Henry Tudor, with French support, became the leading Lancastrian claimant to the throne. And of course, as we just learned, there was a big battle between him and Richard III. Because of his assumption of the throne was controversial, and his claim wasn't the strongest, Henry VII still had to secure his position by unifying the warring factions involved in the Wars of the Roses. So his first action was to make good on his promise and marry Elizabeth of York, so uniting the houses of Lancaster and York through their seven children. Their badge was the Tudor Rose, a combination of the red and white roses of the Lancaster of York. Here is Henry VII, and here on the right, the Henry VII and the Cabot brothers in the Doge's Palace in Venice. Not everyone was convinced by the Tudor king. A number of revolts had to be quelled, and two of the most serious were pretenders to the throne. Perkin Warbeck claimed to be Richard, Duke of York, one of the lost princes in the Tower, and Lambert Simnel claimed to be Edward, Earl of Warwick and son of the Duke of Clarence. Both were dealt with, but not without trouble. Henry was a born administrator. He set about regulating government, increasing administrative efficiency, especially of taxation, promoting foreign trade, strengthening the power of the monarchy. He said to have personally examined the royal accounts almost every day, but he hardly ever called Parliament, only seven in his 24-year reign. 
Medieval laws and ways of doing business were transformed into a more efficient and modern administration. Thanks to his stringencies, the annual royal revenue rose from 52,000 to 142,000 by the time of his death. He also changed the royal council under the court of Star Chamber and charged it with maintaining the highest standards of justice. So as to found a strong dynasty and keep the peace with his neighbours, because wars cost a huge amount of monies, which Henry resented. He carefully married off his children. Margaret to James the Fourth of Scotland, Mary to Louis the Seventh, uh, Twelfth of France, and Arthur to Catherine of Aragon, daughter of Ferdinand the Second of Aragon and Isabella of Castile. In fifteen o two, Henry's eldest son and heir Arthur died in an epidemic, aged fifteen, and his wife Catherine also contracted the mystery illness but recovered. The following year, Queen Elizabeth died in childbirth along with their baby Catherine. Henry died in fifteen o nine. It was said of a broken heart. He left a full treasury, a powerful and wealthy throne, and a prosperous and largely peaceful kingdom. He was buried in Westminster Abbey. And here is a 1486 coin commemorating the marriage of Henry VII to Elizabeth of York. Our next monarch doesn't need much introduction, as we have Henry VIII depicted here in later life in his familiar pose. So in the fact he rolled from 1509 to 1547, of course. In popular imagination, Henry VIII is caricatured by his six wives. Divorced, beheaded, died. Divorced, beheaded, survived. But he was much more than this. In the early years of his reign, he was a true Renaissance king, a sophisticated patron of the arts, very well educated, musical, intelligent, handsome, religious, athletic, and charming. It was only in his later years that his violent temper and single-minded desire for a male heir to establish the Tudor dynasty skewed his reason and almost wrecked the kingdom. Throughout his reign, he was feared and admired in almost equal parts. He was born in Greenwich Palace, London, the third child of Henry the Seventh and Elizabeth of York until the sudden death of his older brother Arthur in 1502. He'd probably been destined for the church and was largely ignored by his father. In the early years, Henry was very religious and attended Mass daily. He lived a childhood life brought up quietly by his mother. So, he acceded to the throne uncontested in 1509, inheriting a stable kingdom and a full treasury. He also claimed his brother's widow, Catherine of Amergen, whom his father had retained in England because he did not want to return her huge dowry. She was some six years older than 17-year-old Henry, but they were genuinely fond of each other and eager to marry, which they did in June 1509. Thirteen days later, they were both crowned at Westminster. Westminster Abbey. Sadly, Catherine lost all of her babies except one, Mary, born in 1516. In 1513, Henry, with the promise of Spanish support, invaded France, where he won a victory at the Battle of Spurs. In September, back in England, the Scottish king, James IV, also his brother-in-law, invaded northern England, only to be soundly beaten at the Battle of Flodden Field, in which King James was killed. In the early 1520s, and across northwestern Europe, Martin Luther and the Protestant Reformation were causing enormous trouble to the established Catholic Church. In 1521, horrified by the rise of Protestantism, Henry wrote a repost, a certio septum sacramentorum, defense of the seven sacraments, supporting the position of the Roman Catholic Church and defending the supremacy of the Pope. For this, Pope Leo X gave Henry the title of Defender of the Faith, but it was revoked in 1530, but retained as a title by the English crown. Henry had executed his father's two chief advisers, Sir Richard Epson and Edmund Dudley, and did not single out anyone above himself until he appointed Thomas Wolsey, a humble butcher's son, as first his advisor, and then his Lord Chancellor in 1515. Through his own marriage and those of his sisters, Henry was closely allied with three of the most important crowns of Western Europe, France, Spain and Scotland, but he also had influence with Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, through Catherine of Aragon, who was his aunt. Peace with France was signed in 1520 at the hugely extravagant festivities at the Field of the Cloth of Gold. By 1525, Catherine was 40 years old and unlikely to produce an heir, but the Tudor dynasty was still too new to risk passing to a female. Henry had fallen for Anne Boleyn, one of the Queen's ladies in waiting, and decided that an annulment of his marriage from Catherine was the answer to the problem. If Pope Clement VII would annul his marriage, as Popes had done before, on the grounds that she had been married to his brother, then he would be free to marry Anne. Cardinal Wolsey was charged with the petition. When he failed in May 1529, he was removed from office and arrested, but died by his trial. 
He was replaced by Sir Thomas More, but More resigned as Chancellor in 1532 when Parliament passed Acts, recognising Henry's supremacy over the Church. Thomas Cromwell became Henry's new advisor, and he used Parliament and his anti-clerical mood to agree the divorce. The wheels were set in motion for the English Reformation. Henry took a real and intelligent interest in the matters of government, personally interviewing foreign ambassadors, frequently attended the debates in the House of Lords. He loved the detail and avidly annotated state documents. His memory was phenomenal, and he said to have been able to remember names, dates, and details of all the papers he signed. However, his counsellor's deliberations bored him, and he would not read long documents and would postpone making crucial decisions as long as possible. He did appreciate that, as an English nation, island a nation, England needed a strong navy, and consequently increased it in size from five ships to fifty-three. In 1532, Pope Clement VII promoted Thomas Cranmer, the Berlin family chaplain, to the position of Archbishop of Canterbury. Unaware that he was prepared to declare Sir Henry's marriage to Catherine of Aragon invalid, and that she was no longer queen. Within a week, Henry and the Protestant Anne Boleyn were married. The Pope was furious, and Henry was excommunicated. Parliament reposted by denying all papal authority, and announcing that the monarch was the sole authority and the supreme head of the church in England. The English Protestant Reformation had started. Equally importantly, Parliament had been used as his instrument to force his will, but in turn had taken increased power to itself as an institution which was never relinquished. We have Anne Boleyn, who was the Queen of England from 1533 to 36. Above the young Henry VIII, progressing to Parliament three years into his reign. And Catherine of Aragon, here. Henry ordered all members of the clergy to swear an oath of allegiance to him as supreme head of the church. Most of them complied, with the notable exception of Sir Thomas More, who was executed for treason in 1535. An enormous consequence of the English Reformation was the wholesale dissolution of the monasteries and abbeys. Monks and nuns were thrown out of their homes to become beggars. The vast monastery lands were distributed to Henry's favourites as gifts or souls, and most of the wealth of the monasteries, which was considerable, disappeared into the royal coffers. The buildings themselves were pillaged for stone, and by 1540 all the monasteries had been dissolved. Despite his second marriage, no male heir appeared. Instead, Anne Boleyn produced a baby girl, who was later Elizabeth I, in September 1533, and Anne was soon disgraced and beheaded in 1536 for treason on trumped-up charges arranged by Thomas Cromwell, who in the process had become Henry's chief adviser. Her successor, Jane Seymour, finally produced a male heir, Edward VI, but she died twelve days later, leaving a sickly baby. Each time Henry looked for a new wife, elaborate plots were followed by the various political factions to catch the king's eye and secure preference positions and influence for their family. Here's Wolsey entertaining Henry VIII at Hampton Court. In 1536, a popular rising in York, the pilgrimage of grace called for England's return to the Catholic fold, the dismissal of Cromwell and the resolution of a number of specific social grievances. The stability of the kingdom was briefly shaken as the pilgrimage of grace threatened to become a widespread movement, but it was ruthlessly put down and the leaders executed. Between the years 1532 and 40, an unprecedented 330 political executions took place, a sure sign of the king's will to enforce changes. Throughout his reign, he is estimated to have executed around 72,000. Catherine of Aragon died in 1536, when Anne was in the early stages of pregnancy. Around the same time, Henry was jousting in a tournament, when his horse fell on him and crushed his leg. He may have even been close to death. The shock caused Anne to miscarry her fifteen-week-old male baby. Henry never forgave her. He was now crippled and in constant pain, and unable to take his usual vigorous exercise. He quickly became huge and even more immobile. Anne was accused of bewitching the king of adultery, incest and high treason, and was beheaded at a public execution at the Tower of London on May the 19th, 1536. Ten days later, Henry married Jane Seymour. At the same time, he signed the laws in Wales Act 1535 that united England and Wales into one unified nation. He also declared his daughters Mary and Elizabeth to be illegitimate, and therefore not eligible to inherit the throne. Two years, Jane gave birth to the much desired son Edward, but died following the difficult birth. Cromwell, a Protestant himself, was pushing the king to make an important foreign Protestant marriage and arranged for his wedding to Anne of Cleves. 
This proved an immediate disaster as soon as Henry saw Anne. She was wise enough to accept a quick annulment, a pension, and a quiet life at Hever Castle in Kent. But Thomas Cromwell was never forgiven. He was made Earl of Essex in 1540, but within three months was arrested and executed. The day he was executed, Henry married Catherine Howard. He was fifty years old, she between fifteen and twenty. The marriage was a disaster, and ended within two years with Catherine accused of treason, really adultery, and beheaded. Still looking for an heir and domestic happiness, Henry married for the fifth and last time. His bride was a widow, Catherine Parr, who was in the household of his daughter Mary. But then he was ill and overweight and probably incapable of fathering another child. Parr's main contribution was to reconcile Henry with his daughters, Mary and Elizabeth, and place them back in line of succession after Edward with the Third Succession Act. This provided for a regency council for Edward should Henry die before his majority. Henry VIII died in the Palace of Whitehall, London, on January the 28th, 1547, aged 55, and buried at Windsor Castle, beside Jane Seymour. We then have the very short reign of Edward VI, 1547 to 1553. Edward VI here, painted as a child by Hans Holbein the Younger. So, of course, he was the much male-desired son of Henry VIII, but he was never a robust child. He was clever and received a good education, and when Henry VIII died in January 1547, he became undisputed king at the age of nine and was crowned at Westminster Abbey on February the 20th, 1547. Henry intended a 12-man regency council to govern until Edward's majority at 18, but his uncle, Edward Seymour, instead assumed the role of Lord Protector of the Realm, the title of Duke of Somerset, and wielded absolute power. The Protestant Reformation had taken firm, uh, firm hold in much of Europe, but despite Henry's break with the Church, England and Wales still remained largely sympathetic to the old ways, as had Henry, despite pocketing the wealth of the Church. The Duke of Somerset and Archbishop Cranmer were determined to establish the Reformation once and for all. Edward had received a Protestant education and completely supported their intent. In 1549, Cranmer produced the Book of Common Prayer, and the Act of Uniformity was passed to enforce its use in the English instead of Latin services in church. People in Devon and Cornwall immediately revolted at the prayer book, while Kett's Rebellion in Norfolk also complained of social and economic injustices, especially against land enclosures. Later was, the latter was suppressed by John Dudley, Earl of Warwick. Heading with his success, Dudley managed to engineer Somerset's downfall in 1551 and had him arrested and executed in 1552. He assumed the role of protector, but not officially, and the title of Duke of Northumberland. Meanwhile, the French had declared war on England. A new prayer book was published in 1552 as part of the renewed campaign to quicken the pace of the Reformation in England. Across the country, religious imagery and statues were destroyed. Edward had never been robust and his illness was diagnosed as tuberculosis. His days were therefore numbered. Northumberland, access to firmly established Protestantism across the country, had the devoutly Catholic Mary Tudor, next in line to the throne, declared illegitimate, and uh, Edward conferred his crown on Lady Jane Grey, a distant Protestant descendant of Henry VIII, who Northampton quickly married to his own son, Lord Guilford Dudley. Edward died on June the sixth, sorry, July the sixth, fifteen fifty three, of tuberculosis, aged fifteen. Northumberland had Jane declared queen, but the overwhelming support across the country was for Mary. Here is Edward the sixth painted just before he came king, and a miniature portrait of him as the Prince of Wales. We then get on to the reign of Mary, all known as Bloody Mary, fifteen fifty three to fifteen fifty eight who was the only surviving daughter of Henry VIII and his first wife, Catherine of Aragon. A rather sickly child, she was very short-sighted and suffered from frequent headaches, but was well-educated and clever. She was named the Princess of Wales and the heir to the throne uh, by her doting father until her life changed completely. Her father became infatuated with and married Anne Boleyn, while Anne Shearer and her mother were separated. They both refused to renounce their Catholic faith. She was demoted to Lady Mary in 1531 upon the divorce of their parents and removed from succession, banished from court, lost servants and forced to serve her half-sister Elizabeth. Five years later, Catherine of Aragon died of cancer and Mary, forbidden to go to her funeral, was forced to sign a submission rejecting the Pope's authority, accepting that her parents had never married and that therefore she was a bastard. <laughs> 
In 1543, Henry's sixth wife, Catherine Parr, worked on the old king to reunite his family. And as we know, the Third Succession Act meant both Mary and Elizabeth were restored to their position as in line to the throne. Here is a painting of Princess Mary after she was allowed to return to court in 1544. And here is a portrait of her by Antonis Moro in 1554. Here is Philip II of Spain with Mary I of England. Seen here in the year they were married. Assailed on all sides to renounce her faith, her prime supporter was Charles V of Spain. Although at times close to her half-brother Edward, he was persuaded on his deathbed to disinherit Mary in favour of the Protestant Lady Jane Grey. But public support was for Mary, and she became queen in August 1553. I think Lady Jane Grey's reign lasted for nine days. Mary's aim was to restore the old religion to the country and overturn Protestant reforms. She chose to marry her Catholic cousin, Philip of Spain, son of Emperor Charles V, but the choice of foreign prince was greatly unpopular with her subjects, and rebellion erupted led by Thomas Wyatt. Princess Elizabeth was arrested and sent to the Tower for two months for being suspected of involvement in the plot. At the age of 38, Mary married the much younger Philip of Spain in July 1554. She was in love. He was marrying for political reasons. Although he was styled King of England, his powers were very limited. The Queen thought herself pregnant, but it proved false, and Philip returned to Spain, leaving her desolate. He became Philip II of Spain on his father's abdication in 1556. All of Edward's religious laws were repealed in the first Parliament, and then all of Henry VIII's in successive Parliaments. In 1555, Mary reenacted the statute of De Heretico Cumbarendo, allowing heretics to be burned at the stake to cleanse their souls. One of the first was to suffer was Thomas Cranmer, who had made her parents' divorce possible. Some 300 or so others followed in the Marian persecutions. Philip of Spain briefly returned to Mary in 1557 and talked her into a war against France. It didn't go well, and the last English enclave on French soil, the port of Calais, fell to the French in January 1558. After another false pregnancy, it turned out to be a tumour, Philip persuaded Mary to name her sister Elizabeth the successor and tried to get her married to a Spaniard. Elizabeth refused, and Mary would not force her. In November 1558, tumour, uh, sorry, Mary died, aged 42, probably of ovarian cancer. And we have the reign, the famous reign of Elizabeth I from 1558 to 1603. Eliza Triumphans by William Modras here. Elizabeth I at prayer on a frost uh, front piece painting to Christian prayers and meditations. Here is a portrait of her by an unknown artist, and her carefully cultivating her image through her magnificent costumes and jewellery and paintings such as this. She was the only child of Henry VIII and his second wife Anne Boleyn, and her mother was executed when she was only 32 months old. She was declared illegitimate and removed from court as her father couldn't bear to see her. Nevertheless, she was extremely well educated. When Catherine Parr became queen, they of course all reconciled as we learnt before. Her sister Mary even had her imprisoned in the tower for two months after she was implicated in the Wyatt Rebellion. She was then allowed to go to Hatfield under semi-house arrest and was there that she heard she'd become queen on November 17th, 1558, at the age of 25. She was crowned amid great celebrations and festivities at Westminster Abbey in January 1559 and quickly made it clear that she would support the establishment of an English Protestant church. But pragmatic compromises were made so Catholics would not be alienated by the new monarchy and the heresy laws were repealed. Throughout her reign, Elizabeth was the target of many marriage proposals. Even Philip II of Spain, her sister Mary's widower, attempted to persuade her to marry him. But Elizabeth, although encouraging suitors, never agreed to marriage. Instead, she used her unmarried status as a lure to leverage her domestic and foreign policies. She knew her foreign prince would be unpopular, and if she married a French prince, there would immediately be war with Spain. Similarly, by marrying an Englishman, she would only faction the country along regional and religious lines. Instead, she became the virgin queen married to her country. In 1562, she survived a bout of smallpox, the cost of scarred care skin and the loss of half her hair. From then on, she took to wearing wigs and thick makeup. One of the greatest threats to Elizabeth's reign was from her cousin, Mary Queen of Scots, who was the Catholic candidate, was supported by the French. 
deeply unpopular, and with her life in danger from the Protestants in Scotland, Mary fled to England for protection, but was instead taken to house arrest for 19 years. The plots began to swirl continuously around her, and her problem and probable involvement in the Babylon plot in 1586. She became too dangerous to live, and Elizabeth finally, reluctantly, signed her death warrant in February 1587. By and large a popular monarch, she established a remarkable stability and religious compromise at a time when civil war could have easily erupted. To reinforce her government, she regularly showed herself to her people around the country on regional progresses, of which she made at least 25 during her reign. These had the secondary attraction of reducing the costs of running the court, as others had the honour of putting up the royal household for a period. In 1570, the Pope issued as papal bull, releasing Elizabeth's subjects from their allegiance. In response, she passed fierce laws against Roman Catholics as plots against her life were uncovered. She found Parliament difficult and largely uncooperative, and only called assembly 16 times during her reign. However, she did not try to alter Parliament's rights, although she vetoed any legislation of which she did not approve. Instead, she ruled by using a trusted group of good counsellors and advisers, chief of whom was William Cecil, Baron Burghley. Spain wanted to control England, and with no prospect of a marriage with Elizabeth, the Spanish Armada of around 130 galleons was assembled and sent to England with the Pope's blessing. Philip intended to re-establish Catholicism and Catholicism and become king as the previous monarch's husband gave him a sound claim, but Elizabeth's navy and favourable winds dispersed the Spanish and the immediate threat of conquest. English navigators and explorers such as Sir Francis Drake sailed the seas to North America where they tried to establish a colony. Virginia was named for Elizabeth. Throughout the 1590s, England suffered from severe economic depression, poor harvests and high prices, and the countryside was especially badly affected. The draining costs of conflict with Spain, France and Ireland affected the economy, uh, economy and pushed taxation higher, and Elizabeth's personal popularity suffered. Elizabeth's religious views are not known, and her actions did not reveal them. Her reign did not see the excesses of the Marian persecutions, although there were burnings. She had to ensure that her Protestant subjects were kept happy, but her reign saw more tolerant attitudes. On the left here we have the Darnley portrait, painted by an unknown artist in 1575. The Queen probably posed for the painting, as it's regarded as the definitive image of her. And here is the Armada portrait, so called because it was painted in 1588, and here she is in 1599. In the late 1590s, the matter of succession became ever more pressing, with Elizabeth refusing to name her successor, leaving her new advisor Robert Cecil to work in secret to secure a smooth transfer of power. Cecil worked with King James VI of Scotland, whose claim was strong but not authorised by Henry VIII's will. He was advised to placate Elizabeth. Elizabeth died after a six-month melancholic illness. A number of her close friends had died at Richmond Palace on March the 24th, 1603. With her entered the Tudor dynasty. She was buried in Westminster Abbey beside her sister, Mary. And I think that's a landmark moment to end this part four of British Kings and Queens. I love getting into the history of this particular time period of England, and I hope you did too. Thank you for joining me, and I look forward to having you with me next time. And until then, goodbye.